Sorry, everybody. Took me a while to get the laptop to work. Not a problem. Thank you. You bet. Now I just make this bigger. Hi. Can you all hear me? I yes. can hear you. Oh, yay. Perfect. All right. I can hear you. Screen participants. There we go. <laughs> I've been, rec I have several emails from people. And I have one from Al. Let me see. Oh, okay. We have five members, so we need three to have a meeting, correct? Four. Four. Um, Al will not be joining us. I, he just sent me a, an email. <clears throat> Let me check with Carson. Um, I, I received an email from Al um, that he's resigning his position with on the committee effective immediately. Um, so that his, his resignation needs to be approved by the council, but I'll forward that um, after our meeting today. If Carson doesn't join, we do not have a forum. We have anybody that wants to speak at public forum, we could do that. Maureen, did anyone um, sign up? Do you know? Can you tell? No. I don't see anyone on. No. Okay. I sent Carson a text. Hmm. Let's give him a couple minutes if you all don't mind waiting. Oh, he's on. We don't see you, Carson. I don't see him on. Um, Carson, can you exit out and come back in? There he is. There he is. Hi. Great. Well, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for signing in. Um, so welcome. I will call this regular meeting of the Code Enforcement Advisory Committee on June 17th, 2020 to order. Um, we'll go ahead and start with roll call. This is Julie Bowden, the chair of the Code Enforcement Advisory Committee. Colleen Dickerson. <laughs> Monica Johnson. Carson Green, and I'm sorry, it, I was on and I heard everything and I could see all of you, but it wasn't showing me or giving you my audio, so I killed it and started it over. I don't know why it didn't work the first try. That's okay, we just got started. Rita Russell, Council Liaison. Dave Lewis, Code Supervisor. Thank you. Okay, item number two on our agenda is consideration of the minutes from our May evening or meeting um, of the Code Enforcement Advisory Committee. Would someone please move to approve? I move. Second. Second. Thank, thank you. Uh, any comments, correction, discussion? After hearing none, then um, is there a motion and a second to approve the minutes? I move to approve the minutes. 
Second. Okay, uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand, say aye. 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 Thank you. The minutes are as, accept, are as accepted as, as um, provided to you. The next um, uh, item on our agenda is a public forum, and it looks like we don't have any attendees to the public forum still. Okay. Then we will move on to the next agenda item, which is uh, our representative from Code Enforcement, Commander um, uh, uh, <laughs> Dave Lewis um, to talk about the significant events from May. Well, thanks for the motion. <laughs> I think they, I, I, you can, it's recorded, so you can share that if you want to. I shall. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Um, the visual title is Officer Code Enforcement Supervisor. Um, thank you. So, as far as um, if everyone has had an opportunity, has everybody had the opportunity to review the statistics? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I really wanted to just highlight a few trends that we're seeing here within the city. Um, it has been brought to the city manager's attention. Uh, one of the biggest trends that we're seeing is an increase in um, trash, uh, trash and litter complaints. And um, it's only slightly highlighted here in May, um, but we've seen the increase continue into June. Um, what we've seen is, and what we believe is this may be a direct result as an impact of COVID. Um, we do have people now at home, are, they are generating uh, increased amounts of trash. Um, trash services have been sporadic. We have been working with the different trash services to make sure that they are consistent. Um, we're also seeing people who are starting to do that behavior with spring cleaning because they are at home. They're they're more eager to start getting involved and in doing things around their house. And so we're seeing a lot more uh, debris um, being placed in public right of ways and alleys um, and on people's property that may not um, necessarily fit within our ordinances. And so we've been working to correct that. And the other shift that we've seen, um, you'll notice a tremendous amount of calls for service related to animal welfare. Um, that increase is specifically due to our increased enforcement within the parks. Um, this was requested at the at um, multiple council meetings. Um, it was discussed during council member choice. We've received numerous emails from the public as well as 911 calls requesting that we be in the park. Um, Parks and Recreation has also received uh, tremendous feedback as well as the city manager. So we have shifted um, a considerable amount of our proactive time to correlate with being more visible in the park. And our, our first opportunity there and what our priorities are is to be a visible deterrent. So you, you will probably see significant time frames of us sitting in parks, driving through parks, being next to parks, um, just to show that increased um, presence. We will step in when we do see violations and we did go through that large educational process. Um, and just to note the 204 cases you see may not be reflective of the actual animals that we contacted. Um, this would be per case or per incident. So per incident may have multiple animals or owners that may have been contacted. Um, as part of this, we've also been utilizing our proactive time in the parks to continue our education on park rules, making sure that social distancing applies, that during some of the emergency orders, as you know, um, code enforcement was part of, part of that um, ask from the governor's office in Tri-County to really um, be a visible present with the social distancing in our parks. And so we also took that moment to re-emphasize and re-educate the public on what the expectations and behaviors are, whether that relates to fishing at Centennial Park, um, being responsible with trash and litter, our animal ordinances, not just off-leash, but making sure that animals are under voice control um, and that people are picking up uh, waste and making sure that um, items are available to citizens um, in the parks in, in form of waste bags, making sure those continue to be stocked and really working with the parks and recreation uh, uh, department on a few small minor maintenance issues or trash issues. Um, we've also taken the opportunity to continue to educate the public on what city council had passed relating to non-smoking in the parks and just re-emphasizing the, the healthiness of our, of our parks and our citizens. Okay. Colleen? 
And I have several questions, but my first one is I don't really understand this. There's no detail, and it seems to have uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020 on here. Is that correct? That is correct, and, and Kelly, this is actually the format that we have moved forward with, um, approved by the city manager and presented to city council. We felt that this was the best uh, and most accurate report so that we can compare trends from year to year. Um, and this is the report that is currently now available. Okay, but there's no detail. Uh, and uh, are you including under animal control, animal welfare costs? Animal control under uh, that category relates to all animal related issues. Okay. Uh, now, my, uh, in 2018, uh, according to this thing, you know, the award you got for Animal Agency of the Year, it says that were a thousand animal related calls. Uh, that you responded to, and I, I will leave off the adjectives because you know what they are, uh, but you're not reflecting that here. You only have 135, but according to this award, you responded to 1,000. Responding to calls for service is one thing. Filing a case, which of these are cases, official case documents, they are not calls for service. So some calls for service are captured by CAD, um, and those, uh, are not reflected in this. They are reflected in the overall year um, reports that are presented by the police department. Dave, okay. Dave, does the, um, so the numbers here, like if we look at <clears throat> illegal dumping uh, for two, 2020, there's 17. Is that where you have left a notice or a summons? These are whenever cases have been open where code enforcement has been contacted and has gone out to do an investigation or worked with okay. the particular property owner. Um, and again, these are, these are official cases. Not every single um, call for service, even with the police department, merits an official case. It is documented in our dispatch system that that call came in or we may have spoken to somebody on a phone if it was transferred. Um, but not all um, activities require uh, a full case investigation. So, um, for example, um, I sent in a case um, or a request for service for weeds, or not for weeds, for a dangerous dog, and it came back that, that you know, there were, was a review and they decided it was in a dangerous dog. Would that have appeared on this since it received a case? Yes, because you... It was something that needed to be investigated. Okay. Animal call complaints are always investigated. Regardless of the merit, we have to investigate any of the okay. cruelty and neglect cases. It's mandated. Okay. Monica? Just quickly, um, I want to say I think it's great that you are having a greater presence in our parks because they're being used so much more right now. Um, and your presence is, I'm sure, a deterrent. Um, and I wanted to ask in regards to social or physical distancing, those, are those policies still in place um, in our parks? So I can't answer that as of right now because we did transition to a new, uh, code enforcement is not a part of that program through the governor's office. So our social distancing um, enforcement has, our educational component of that has ended. So who would be responsible at this point for enforcing whatever um, whatever social or physical distancing recommendations are in place? At there this is no enforcement component currently in place from the Tri-County Health Department that I'm aware of. Um, it has been left to an educational component unless you are licensed. If you have some type of license that may be in jeopardy, then it is reported to the Tri-County Health Department. And that's typically done through the police, the police department or impact unit. Um, they usually do a referral to that department and it's up to the Tri-County Health Department um, to really do that enforcement component. Okay, the, the reason why I ask is that uh, the parks near where I live are very close to Denver and Denver's uh, being pretty strict and it feels like our parks are, um, having a little more activity that way. And I'm seeing some things that appear to be not safe. Um, and I didn't know if there was any 
anything, any recourse for that? Um, no, right now we really, and as, as a whole, as, as Inglewood, I, I'm really proud to say that we are taking the educational approach, um, whether it's the police department or code enforcement or other city employees, um, we're really trying to stick with that and letting the public make the most educated decision that's best for them and best for the community. So we remind them of what's in place. We remind them of what the orders were at that time. And we let them make that decision as to whether or not that's appropriate for them and their family. Excellent. Thank you. Carson has a question. Carson? You're, you're on mute. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> similar to um, Colleen's question about the details. So like the old reports, there was the, the, there were two separate reports, right? That always came through. One was, um, I, I'm not, I'm not even remembering it exactly right. One was like total interactions and one was like follow-ups or something like that. Is it? One was cases opened and the other one was action types. Right. We're, we're transitioning from that current system. So that system is, is inadequate. Um, we're moving to this new RMS system. And so we were trying to find the best bridge between the two um, because that detailed reporting will no longer exist. And it's inaccurate. Like I said in the last minute meeting, it, it does not capture all of the activities. And it's really unfair to have that in the public when it doesn't capture all of the work that something may be done on a case. It might have one particular action or two actions when in fact the case may be months old during the investigation and it doesn't really show the public um, the true accuracy of what's being done on a case just like a, a, a police report if you were to take a, a detective report um, you couldn't necessarily break out all of those actions that that program was doing um, that a detective would go through to investigate uh, some type of a crime that took place. So are you actually capturing more so data are, now with the new system? So the new system is not fully integrated um, currently. So again, this is just a bridge and this is something that's going to get us to the new report. I don't know what the new reporting is going to look like. I have not had an opportunity to look at the reports that are generated or how that would be generated. So Does, this was the, the best compromise that we could come up with with our current system. I see. Does the, when someone uses the app and reports something, does it go into the new system now? So it depends on the type of case that we have. If someone's just seeking general information, which we do get um, quite a few where people are just, they couldn't find something on the website or they have a general question about, I need a permit for this or um, something I'm moving to the area, can I have a probability pick kind of situation? Those aren't captured in this. That's not a case that didn't take a formal action of a code off. Um, but if it was, for example, an animal cruelty case or a dangerous dog or a bite report where a dog bit someone or wildlife bit someone or another person, that is captured in this report. So it is cases that are officially open and investigated. And this, this is keeping with best practices for the police department and best practices around the country as to cases that are reported. And then once a year, total uh, amounts of calls for service and time spent on calls, all of those are broken out in, a, in an annual report to the police department. Is the, is the amount of data tracked per call report, whether it comes in from the app or a phone call or just an officer observed you know, action, are we capturing as much data as we were previously or less? We are capturing more and we'll continue to capture more. Um, we're looking at other programs such as potentially GPS um, that would track uh, where, we've, where we've been, how long we've been, how long our response times are. Um, this is something that is a nationwide standard and our department has one of the most state-of-the-art CAD systems. So it actually captures um, what kinds of calls we've been on, what, how long we've been there, how long it might have taken us to get to a specific call for service. And, and council requests that frequently from specific critical incidents. They'll ask, how long did it take to respond to a call or how long were they on a call? What officers were there? Um, the CAD system total really captures that. And then those reports are reported in statistics to the FBI, um, to the Carl Bureau of Investigation. Some of this stuff is being data loaded onto our website and, and, and GPS mapping. Um, 
And so that, that does not translate into this. This is case, strictly cases that are open that require some type of action. What about in regard to like the categorization? Like you guys had the pretty extensive depth to categories in the old right. reporting. Is all of that still being tracked no. or not? The new system is going to be based solely, I believe, on statute numbers, which is part of the conflict that we have with not having accurate data to present is because it was subjective to what category it may have fallen under. And so with the new reporting, and I, I, again, I wish I had more answers regarding the new reports and how that'll be generated, but they're being, the data is being uploaded currently um, for the transition and they are going to be categorized per statute. Interesting. Okay. But how, and how long do you think you'll be using the interim report versus whatever the new reporting is going to be? So our timeframes here at the police department, and again, I'm speaking outside of my turn with the police department. I can only tell you what we've discussed in command staff. Um, there has been some transitions and council is aware of this, that um, we were supposed to be in this new system, I believe starting testing in December. Um, there's been some buyouts and changes some conversion data um, complications. And so it's been delayed a couple of times. Um, I don't have the newest data as to when we're expecting that. So this, this could be a month. It could be up to December. Can't answer that right okay, now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Colleen, um, Colleen, in the future, there's a, if you um, open the participant um, panel, there's a raise your hand. That way you don't have to keep raising your hand. <laughs> Sometimes you I raise, can't get that up. But I will try. Okay. All right. I had a couple of questions that I didn't get out before, but uh, last meeting, um, Mr. Lewis, you um, you did tell us that there had been some data provided to Parks and Recs and Council, and that you would get it to us. And we haven't received anything for March, nor have we received that. I did go on the Parks and Recs for. April 23, and I got some of the information, uh, but it kept cutting in and out on me, and I don't know if it was my fault or not, but I would very much appreciate it if you could share with us at our next meeting all of the data that you provided to uh, Parks and Recs about uh, animal control and uh, Council on animal control and any data you've got on March. Um, I apologize about March. I thought that had been attached to this and that may have been an oversight between Maureen and I. Um, that will be attached. And then as far as the parks data, I think that is available. I can look to see it was just a spreadsheet that was presided, presented as to the calls for service that we are receiving in the parks. I found a I found a presentation um, that had been given on March 30th from Parks and Rec that had code enforcement data in that was that was that where it was used? Correct, and and that was not my presentation. The presentation right. was conducted by Parks and Recreation. Right. Right. Um, that information was presided presented to uh, the director of Parks and Recreation who put that presentation together. So if you share the the data with us, then we'll have the information. Yeah, I, I may ask Maureen if maybe we can just pull that portion and republish that um, that presentation that was uploaded by the director. I think that would be consistent in in the information that's been presented to council and the information that it's the exact same information that was presented to Parks and Rec, okay. that uh, slideshow. Okay. For those slides. Okay, so you'll be forwarding that to Maureen and she can include that in our minutes. I don't have the slide, but that okay. or those documents, those documents okay. um, were presented by the Parks and Recreation Director and they are uploaded in the council packet. So we'll just need to find that presentation and upload that for next month. Or right. I can email you that presentation and you, or you, it's available and you can email it out to your members, whichever you prefer. I, I downloaded that. I think I downloaded it and um, uh, where would I have put that? Uh, okay, I, I thought I thought I, I thought I found it. Was that the March 30th uh, special session or was it a different? Uh, I apologize. I don't remember. There was a presentation done to council. I was I had a brief portion and it basically went over the off leash um, recommendations from parks 
and the statistics that we presented, um, and I believe that might have been that date. I don't yeah, recall. Yeah, that's I, I downloaded that. Colleen, that's what I sent to you. I tried to do it and I can't, I couldn't get it. <laughs> so I, no, I, I, I downloaded it for you and sent it to you in an email. Oh, that I understand. I'm talking about raising my hand because I had another question after that. Oh, okay, sorry, okay. Uh, I tried to get the person to notify you uh, of her problem, but uh, I got uh, an email, actually a text from somebody who doesn't have uh, okay. internet access. Uh, well, I would appreciate it since this is potentially a case. I would appreciate not having this conversation over an open forum. They really do need to contact me or, or we can meet, but I'd prefer not to have a conversation about a potential case. Colleen, well, I, would you please provide her with the phone number for code enforcement and have her call code enforcement? She doesn't need to do anything other than pick up the phone and call. Okay. I have. She knows how to get in touch with everybody. But she she was questioning uh, the process. Okay, she is more than welcome to reach out me personally if she has a concern or a complaint and we can discuss the process with her directly. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions for- uh, Yeah, I just had one more. Oh, sorry, uh, okay. what, sorry. What is person? illicit discharge? So we've had some significant cases here in the city of Inglewood and if you don't yeah. know, we, our responsibilities overlap with wastewater and so illicit discharges is where we co-investigate or investigate a case where something, for example, um, human feces or waste may be illegally dumped into the river um, or uh, an auto body shop may be illegally dumping paint material. These are examples, uh, paint material um, down a sewer, uh, sewer drain um, or maybe somebody had spilt antifreeze and it's running down their driveway into the drain system, that would be considered an illicit discharge. Cool, thank you. Yeah. All right, any more questions for Code Enforcement Supervisor Lewis? All right, hearing none, we'll go on to our next agenda item, uh, which is number five, an update from our city council liaison, council member Russell. Thank you very much. Um, the only update I believe that I have for code enforcement, we appointed two new members, um, okay. member Bowden, member Dickerson, and mem my, uh, member um, Johnson were reappointed. And we have two new members, Kara Frang of Payne and Sonia Strong. So I'm assuming the next meeting, uh, let's see, we're still in June. So it'll probably be the first meeting of July. Is that correct? That's, yeah. Yep. Okay. That's what the, that's what the email said. And I was given their contact information and I'll reach out to them and introduce myself and kind of give them an update on uh, what we're working on. And uh, Maureen, or they were also sent um, Bob's Rules of Order and other um, materials for being part of a, a committee too. Um, thank you. And I, great. I do have one other thing. I, um, council member Anderson and myself asked for council um, to discuss about perhaps when we, when we can go back to city hall. So I'm hoping that, um, that we will be able to do that soon. So it's just, it's much easier. Um, so we'll see, that's, there's no decision on that yet, but it will be coming up for discussion. So. Um, question, um, we've always had an alternate on the committee. So, uh -huh. so we don't have, so we have two new members, but none, neither of them are alternates, correct? Uh, I believe that is correct, just a minute. Um, I, I believe that there is no alternate. Um, is that normal? Is that, in, is that usual? Well, I think part of what's happened now, there were, I think there were 12 or 13 applicants for all the boards and commissions. And so not all of the openings got filled um, okay. this time. So I, you know, we, um, 
I think that Member Johnson did a really good job of encouraging people to apply for code enforcement as well as other boards. And I think we just need to do that. We need to um, make sure we get more applicants. And I think that will help us fill that alternate position also. Okay. Um, Rita, I, I don't know if you heard me say that we received a resignation from Al. <clears throat> so we're, yes. So I'll, uh, Maureen, I'll forward you his resignation, which then needs to go to council. Okay. Any question, other questions for council member Russell? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to the next topic, which is communication subcommittee update. Um, lots of news going on here. Um, I, I was able to talk with Chris Harguth, um, who is the communications uh, manager for the city and is responsible for Inglewood Magazine and all the social media. And um, two things are going on. Um, there is a uh, in about two weeks, a special edition of Inglewood Citizen Magazine coming out specifically for COVID-19. Therefore, the next uh, issue of Inglewood Magazine will be in the fall, and our articles will be due August 10th. Um, we talked about um, the idea of having a full page dedicated to Emerald Ashbor, and he approved that. He couldn't. He can't promise a full page because things change, but he he said go ahead and move forward with doing, you know, more extensive information um, on the topic. And he also approved us doing our regular article on top of that for alleys, which is great. Um, so the next steps there are that we need to assign those articles to be written. Um, and I, I, so far, I, I think it's just Colleen and I on the committee. Did we put you on the committee, Monica? <laughs> um, I'd be happy to help with that. Okay, um, so, so what we've done in the past, um, is you know we agree on what the topic will be, and then um, that someone writes a draft, and then we 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 um, send it into uh, code enforcement to review, um, and then once they have buy off, then we send it um, to the committee for review. Um, so I would be happy to write the article on Emerald Ashbor since um, I've I've been doing a lot of the research. Um, Chris felt like it would be important to show a visual map that, that of the city, not, not detailed map, but just basically showing that this thing is coming at us because it is, um, just to kind of give a visual alert that, hey, we've got something coming at us and we need to pay attention to it. So I'd be happy to write that draft with uh, Monica or Colleen, would you be willing to um, write the alley maintenance? article I started on it okay I've started on it I've got a lot of research and I'd be happy to work with Monica on it okay what what do you think the focus of the alley maintenance would be is it removing is it mostly just the trash and and what residents are responsible for on the alley yes uh, but there are a lot of issues and I don't know how much we want to get into it because a lot of what we are considering alleys don't belong to the city, so they aren't really public rights of way, uh, but they're being handled as though they are. So there's that issue. And then there's the issue of uh, grading and maintenance and there's uh, and the responsibility of the city for some things. Uh, I just don't know how much you wanna get into all of that, but what I was gonna do was prepare, because I've already looked at all the codes that mention alleys and there's very, very little about alley maintenance, very little. And, and uh, but there's an awful lot of mention of alleys in the code. So there's, you know, uh, the exits and line of sight and different things, uh, but probably just alley maintenance uh, from the standpoint of who is responsible for what. Right, and, and I, you know, we gotta remember that these are, you know, residents and they're, they just really need to know what they're responsible for. I, I don't think we need to get into 
what the city does and what they do. Let's just let them know what their responsibilities are. And that's so, probably, the primary issue is weeds and trash, right? Uh, that's what I understand. Okay. Uh, and trees that are in the alleys. Right. Because that's the excuse that trash companies are using for not going down the alleys. So people are leaving their trash cans out on the street in front of their houses because the, uh, they won't, they have too big a trucks to go down the alleys because it's taking out uh, all of the uh, electricity. Okay. Okay. Um, Dave, is there any other issues that you see routinely um, regarding alleys beyond trash, um, weeds, and trees that need to be trimmed? Yeah, by? it's the trash weed and an increase in illegal dumping. Um, uh -huh. And that isn't captured directly with ours because a lot of the illegal dumpings aren't even rerouted to our department. Um, a lot of them don't have follow-up where we need to investigate. So it goes directly to Public Works where um, we have a courtesy pickup currently for some large items, but that program may be fizzling out and we may be requiring homeowners to potentially step in and help with some of the trash cleanups behind their property. And again, that's something that's currently in conversation. Um, it's in discussion with the task force that's looking at single hauler services. So it is a larger conversation that I'm just a small part of. Correct, okay. So why don't we kind of narrow the, the topic down to those, those four issues, Colleen and, and Monica, um, because you know, you're not gonna have a lot of room, but like we've done in the past, just you know, cover what residents need to know what they're responsible for. Um, and regarding um, EAB. Um, I'd like to work with you on that too. Okay, cool. I, I was, you know, we, we, we did have some initial introductory information in the, in the article that we submitted, but it didn't make it um, into the publication because of space restrictions. So I think we can restart with that. And, and once again, you know, inform people that, you know, we have this issue, but they have a chance to prepare for it and then also give them a reason why they should prepare for it because they're going to be losing um, their trees. Um, so the, the articles won't be due until August 10th. So um, what I'd like to do is see if we can have a draft for committee review at our next meeting in July. That'll give us four weeks. Um, and then we have you know, a couple weeks after that before it's actually due to the city, if that works for you guys. It works for me. Okay. Monica's right. practically next door, so it won't be a problem. No. Okay. Just hop on over. Right. Um, and and as a, a side issue, since I'm talking about EAB, I've been I sent you all um, a plan that Dave Lee present or uh, uh, put together for um, the city's approach to EAB, um, and he approved me sharing that with you all. I think it's an FYI at this point because it's it's really what the city is going to be doing in terms of preparing for that EAB. Um, it really doesn't cover the residential piece of it. So I think that's where we can um, step in and help residents prepare. I signed uh, up for that. You did? The thing that you sent out. And yeah. one of the questions on there uh, form was does your community have an urban wood utilization program? I didn't think we did, but I wasn't really sure. I just put no. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I thought that was really cool that they yeah. have the idea to take that wood and provide it to artisans to use it for something. Yeah. I thought that was a great idea. Well, well they, ha they, they have to force being careful with it because it. Yeah they can spread with it. And that's probably how it has spread, it sounds like. Yeah. Colleen? Uh, that is a problem. Uh, that's what happened in Boulder. And what you have to do with infected ash wood is a uh, triple chip it and burn it. So it can't be used otherwise, unless they take it down before it's infected. Well, that's, um, I'll, I'll be curious to see what the, you know, what all the cities are seeing the opportunities uh, to use the wood for. And thank you, um, Monica and Carson for signing up for that. It's, it's, it's a commitment, it's a couple of hours. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> I don't know. I don't know that I'll be able to attend the whole thing, but I'll I'll get a part of it at least. Okay. Okay. That's the nice thing about having summers off. Yeah, and I will be on vacation, so I'm I'm not going to plan on attending. So thank Good you for, for doing you. that. <laughs> and then right. just one other thing on what you were talking about for the alleys related to the trash. I know that um, city council, I believe next Monday in your um, study session, they are going to be uh, talking about who they're appointing to that tr um, trash committee for um, participating in, you know, the process for potentially taking us to a single hauler. And so I, I know that they're making progress on whether we're, you know, it's going to go towards that. And I would be hopeful. I'm, I'm actually trying to get on that committee too. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the city will be, um, you know, effective at using the leverage of getting, uh, you, you know, going to using the leverage of having such a big contract to force the provider to provide full alley service for anyone who wants it, both recycling and trash. So, you know, because I think it's ridiculous how many people are having to like not be able to have their trash and recycling on the alley when that was how it always has been. And now having to put it in front of their house, especially when there's already an increase in parking problems, et cetera. Right. Okay. All right. Are, are there a question? Um, Carson, did, did you get notified that your application was received? Yeah, and I did the follow-up um, letter as well. And I, and the reason I knew you guys were going to be discussing this next Monday was because I wrote in asking what the status of it was, and she said she responded telling me that. Right, and I just I had asked about that a week or so ago about what the status was. Um, so at one point, I think there's 11 applicants. That's what I know now. And at one point, we talked about perhaps putting everybody on the committee, but. We'll see what happens next Monday. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Any other questions on communications and what we're doing um, for the fall in terms of uh, educating the community on code? If not, then we'll go ahead and move forward to a new business. Um, we've got some a uh, couple of things, election of a uh, chair for the committee and then election of a vice chair, and then also uh, changing our meeting time from 5.30 to 6. Are there any um, um, motions to additional new business items from anyone? Colleen? Yeah, I think we ought to do a complete, finish our comprehensive review of Title Seven, Chapter 1, A through C, rather than piecemeal it since the only person that really was pushing for that is no longer on the committee. What are so, you referring to? The trees? No, dogs. But uh, we uh, should go, I think the trees should be first and then do Title Seven, a comprehensive review of Title Seven, because there are a lot of inconsistencies in it. What's Title Seven? Uh, animals. So that you're talking about revising our priorities? Yeah. Well, why don't we cover that um, under unfinished business? Well, you said new, new, and I wanted to do a, a comprehensive review of Title VII, Chapter 1, which is code enforcement, animal welfare, and animal control. Because there are a lot of inconsistencies in it and a lot of codes that aren't being uh, enforced because they weren't meant to be enforced. They didn't have anything to do with Inglewood. Okay, so the new business item is that you would like to add Title Seven comprehensive review to our list of priorities? Yes, but I, I would also like to move the trees and shrubs because of the emerald ash borer and our recommendations on it uh, to the next priority. Are there comments? Okay, so I will add that is item number D. I mean, based on what uh, Mr. Lewis had told us, the animal definition aspect sounded to me like 
a pretty important and potentially simple thing to change and get through to make a difference because right now it's got this, you know, they're not able to address animals that are not dogs and cats. Yes, they are. Okay, so well, let's go ahead and start with item A first before we start covering priorities. Um, Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, that's okay, that's okay. I was trying to understand um, what the new business item was myself. So, um, so election of the chair of the committee. Do I have any nominations? I nominate uh, Ms. Bowden for chair. I second. I third. <laughs> <laughs> if we can get a fourth, we might not have to hold the election. Uh, I, I accept. I, I, so all those in favor of, uh, of electing Julie Bowden as chair of the committee, please raise your hand, say aye. 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 That, that's unanimous, Maureen. Thank you so much. And then moving forward to the election of the vice chair of the Code Enforcement Advisory Committee. Are there any nominations? I nominate. I second that. It was that Carson, because I'll third that. Yay, we're unanimous. <laughs> all right. So all right, I all accept, those in, thanks. <laughs> all those in favor of electing Carson Green as the vice chair of the Code Enforcement Advisory Committee, please raise your hand, say aye. Do I vote? <gasps> Yes, do I have a, okay. Aye. 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 It's unanimous either way, so. <laughs> That's okay. the fastest work we've done yet in my time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you all. Um, and then the third item is our conversation to change our meeting time from 5.30 to 6 p.m. Uh, I open the floor for discussion. I move to change the meeting time from 5.30 to 6.00. I, I, I also support that that change. I second it. All right. So all those in favor of moving our meeting time from 5.30 p.m. to 6 p.m., please raise your hand. Say hi. A A I. Hi. <laughs> hi. All right. We got a unanimous okay there also. Um, Julie? Yes, ma'am. Who seconded that? I Cohen. did. Cohen? Cohen did, yes. Thank you. Yes. So the next item was what uh, Cohen requested that we discuss, um, and that is the priorities. Oh, no, um, we go ahead with the bylaws and then discuss the second priority. Don't you want to discuss the bylaws? Yes, so, I, so, so we're going to move it into unfinished business, what you requested. Bylaws? No, you had asked that we have a comprehensive review of Title VII and then move trees and shrubs up in, in terms of priority. Yeah, but I, I wanted it, trees and shrubs in the second position and then Title VII because then that will take care of the issue of animal definition. Okay, so um, if you'll allow me to bring up um, our list of priorities um, that will help us um, Will you share that, Julie? Yes, I will share that. Uh, it's in the packet because it, oh, okay. it's, it's in our minutes from the last one. Oh, okay. Just, great. Good. I can just share. I'll, I'll bring that up. Um, where did that go? Page six of nine. Oh, we kept all the um, information in there. Got it. Okay, I will go ahead and share my screen. How did I do that before? <laughs> uh, I know it's I've right in the middle on the bottom. Oh, share screen. There we go. Are you all seeing that? Yeah. Okay. Um, it kind of changes my view, so I don't think I can see you raise your hand, um, but I can see your faces. So here is um, a listing of our priorities. Um, obviously, um, the bylaws um, review was the first one, and then here's the second 
priority was animal definition, where um, we redefine animals to be more than just dogs and cats. I know that that is something that was important to code enforcement. That was my understanding. Um, so, um, Julie, if I may, if I may, yes, it's uh, a lot more complicated than that. When uh, you and I were on the committee in 2017, we discussed that and uh, we never got around to fixing it because then somehow it all got changed without our knowledge. And uh, it's complicated because they separated the code between animals and dogs and cats. But there is, they have the ability to impound animals other than dogs and cats. It's written into the code under animals. So you're proposing that we remove the second priority? No, oh, well, replace it with a comprehensive review of the title because it's going to take that because they've got a, two separate code sections for animals and a separate one for dogs and cats. And there's a bit of confusion because they talk about animals under dogs and cats. So it's gonna take a lot more than just a simple change of definition. But uh, I wanted to, there wasn't a consensus to make that the second priority. Uh, yeah, yes, yes it was, there was, that's why it's, we've listed it here. Well, no, I don't think there was because the, the idea was to do the bylaws first so we knew what we could do and what we couldn't do. And then we were going to finish trees and shrubs because of the deadline. The fact is it's not going to be a simple matter to change just a definition because the, it, the code has been separated and it's going to have to work out, you know, put it back together. But in the meantime, they can and do impound animals other than dogs and cats, which was, and if you want to go ahead and discuss that tonight, after we work on the bylaws, that's fine, but uh, it's not a simple matter. And the fact is I've got the codes that show that they can impound other than dogs and cats. If the court decides that the impound doesn't stand and they return it, well, that's got nothing to do with code. I was at the meeting where this was all discussed and, and, I, and I know that this was something that um, Supervisor Lewis brought up. Um, any comments from the people, uh, you know, Monica or, or Carson, you well, guys were there. I just Monica? wanted to ask Mr. Lewis if, if the way that I captured that because I was the one who ran that meeting was if that's accurate or not, or if, or maybe he could clarify a little bit. So I just, when you asked me what our priority would be, it would not be specifically under the definition. Um, the animal code is complicated, but this is specifically related to cruelty and neglect of that code. And it specifically, for dogs and cats for cruelty and neglect. We cannot impound a chicken. We cannot impound a potbelly pig. We cannot impound a snake um, for cruelty and neglect. They would have to be at large. Um, and that has been reaffirmed multiple times by the municipal court. They have said that we cannot impound an animal for cruelty and neglect outside of a dog or a cat. Just so that you all have the correct information of where we currently are with the municipal court system and the way the code reads. Yeah, thank you. That is, I mean, I remember you explaining it that way and and that's what we, when we all voted and made that the second thing, it was because it sounded like that was, you know, a potentially easy change that would make it so that we could deal with this, you know, it sounds like you guys have had situations where you've seen cruelty and not been able to address it and not, you know, that seemed like a direct thing. I understand Ms. Dickerson saying that there, it's complicated and we may have to go through the whole animal, you know, 
code and I understand we've already done a bunch of work on trees and maybe finishing that out makes sense. So, I mean, for me, it could go either direction. I was just thinking that this cruelty thing, you know, when, when I voted to make that second, it was because it sounded like it was, you know, low hanging fruit. Monica, you had a question? You're on mute. You're still on mute. There you okay. go. All right. I just want to piggyback on what Carson said. Um, I appreciate uh, Colleen's um, interest in revising that whole section, but it sounds like, as she says, complicated, a laborious process that deserves serious consideration. And maybe we could just um, change that simple definition to make um, Dave Lewis more effective right now and finish that tree project and then come back to it and give it the attention it deserves because I think uh, from what I understand from our meetings is that um, the, the trees are our are, are biggest uh, push right now um, you know and that we've already done work on that so just that's just my two cents um, like to come back to it perhaps and just do the um, uh, the cruelty section. Okay. If, it, if it's easy and can be done that way and then revisited. Okay. Colleen? The fact is that uh, there is no impoundment for dogs and cats at large in that mm -hmm. definition. It's only for cruelty. But there is for animals at large impoundment in there. Uh, and yes, there isn't a specific thing on impounding for cruelty. But the fact is, did you not, Dave Lewis, uh, come before us sometime, uh, I think it was at least a year ago, and say that you had uh, impounded animals that weren't dogs and cats, quite a few of them from a breeder, and that you uh, before cruelty and neglect. Well, oh, if I if I can stop you there, I we're you know we're not here to. No, no, um, I'm I'm just asking what kind of a problem it is because yeah. obviously he did impound, and we never heard that it got rejected until what a year and a half, two years later, in our uh, February meeting. Is it a problem? because it says it's unlawful, so the, you've got to have a, a way, you should be able to get it, uh, whether it's spe specified in the code or not, because it's not specified. I mean, you have impounded dogs and cats at large, but it's not specified in the code that you can do that. So he I just said the, the courts <laughs> had confirmed that they're not able well, to deal with cruelty of non -do dogs and cats that are not at large. Well, can we get that evidence? Because uh, we, well, we what, have- Well, what we're here to talk about is at this point is whether or not we revise our priorities. And, and what I would like to suggest is that there's enough conversation going on here and confusion that we do go ahead and dress it and understand it. And then we can decide whether it's something that we want to either you know address right then and you know right now or is it something that we want to push back a little bit because it requires a more comprehensive review so well, do you want to put that ahead of bylaws then uh no i think we're we've already uh we're prepared to do the bylaws today so i don't see a need to do that okay <laughs> Uh, um, so the what I am hearing is that we are sticking with is ever are Monica and uh, Carson. Are you okay with that to stay with the current priorities? Yeah. Carson? Yes. Okay. I th I think the way you just said it makes sense. Identify, okay, cool. understand it. If there is something we can do on it quickly to address the cruelty problem, great. If it's going to require the bigger overall set of work, then yeah, let's put that after okay. trees. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. And at that I'm going to close um, new business and start our discussion on unfinished business. Um, and I, I'd like to start with thanking everybody um, for all the work that you've done um, outside of the meeting to understand what this task is. But if I can summarize it, 
we have revised the enabling legislation for um, the Code Enforcement Advisory Committee, and those revisions need to be reflected in our bylaws. The bylaws are ours. They are ours to be rewritten and reviewed and reconsidered. So once we um, revise the bylaws and uh, move to approve it, that it goes on to record, it does not go to council or uh, legal for approval. So the, the job that we have is to revise our bylaws to reflect the changes in the ordinance or in the enabling legislation that is coming up from the ordinance. And then secondly, are there any other things outside of that that we would like to include in our bylaws? So that's, that was the task at hand. Did anyone understand anything different from that? Okay, so I, it was complicated. <laughs> Um, and and I, I must uh, I have to thank Colleen publicly because she got us started, and I believe that Colleen's you know caught you know ninety percent of all the the edits that were needed. Um, and then um, I took the doc, the that document, um, uh, put in Colleen's comments, um, and then I passed um, the link around and had each of you review individually, Monica. You're on, you're on mute. Are you still sharing the screen? Oh, that would be my... You email. might want to stop sharing. That's all, sorry. Actually, um, I'm going to go back to... Um, here, anyway. <laughs> um, I'm going to keep sharing my screen because of, of what we need to do. So. Um, so what I asked you all to do was to, was to look at our current bylaws, review the uh, proposed ordinance for our enabling legislation, and then write your comments. Um, and then I pass that around to each member individually. And then this afternoon, after everyone's had a chance to review it, I took that document and accepted all the changes so that we could review it. Um, it's very complicated if, if you look at it with all our edits. And if I can open up um, this, um, this is what the bylaws look like with all of our edits and comments, and it's very confusing. So what I propose is that instead of looking at that version, we look at this version with all of the um, uh, comments or all the edits accepted. But what that means is, is you, have, you need to have in front of you um, any of the comments that you put in um, so that we can discuss those um, if, if there are any questions. Is that clear or not? <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any other suggested way to, to approach this? No, that makes sense. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, uh, by the way, Colleen, um, I started a new document and there were some things I wasn't able to copy over. So I put your, your edits in here um, so that you could see that I, I didn't drop your comments. Um, um, so uh, well, I can't get to that one, unfortunately, but that's neither here nor there. So I sent, I sent you the document. It, sh it should be in the Word document that I sent you. And I'm showing it on the screen too. Well, I can't see it on the screen. <laughs> there we go. I've got it on the screen. Oh, great. Okay, good, good. Okay, so um, the first change was was primarily to um, add in the fact that we um, that council passed a new ordinance modifying our enabling legislation. Okay. Um, then. The second or the section three is that this is it, it, um, adjusted to match word for word what's in the enabling legislation now in terms of our purpose. Oh, shoot. I, I keep losing it. <laughs> there we go. You with us? I think so. Every time okay. I look at the screen, it, it changes it. Okay. I can't, why is it not going down? Oh, you haven't done it. I can't do it. All right. Uh, Colleen, can I, can I suggest you, you know, the original document that you sent me and Carson, 
on your edits, why don't you pull that up and use that because this will reflect your edits. And that um, way I don't know how to pull that up, tell you the truth. And there were a couple of edits that I didn't do in because I was only dealing with the enabling legislation. There were a couple of other things, one of which was caught by somebody, uh, the duplication on uh, attendance. Okay. But uh, I think it was section 12 right under there uh, that probably we need to take out because okay, so, you're, we're, we're, uh, so I'm still on the first page. Okay. Um, the, well, the, the only reference was, you know, that didn't make it in was the one where the city council on such and such a date changed our yeah, enabling and I, and, I, and, I, and I put I put that in here. Okay, it's, the one I'm looking at isn't there, but. Okay, look, uh, and you, you can't, can you see my screen? Yeah. Can you see where my cursor is? Yeah. So here oh, I've- Oh, so you've got that ad, okay. Right, right. I just wasn't able to copy it over for some reason, so I just put it in as, as, as my comment, but I put your name in front of it so everyone knew where it came from. Okay, so, so, so I'm, I'm fine with that, adding that in, that we're adjusting it to reflect the new enabling, enabling legislation. I think um, the prior bylaws, um, instead of saying section three, oh no, that was purpose, okay. Um, the next section, section four, was previously just powers, um, and then we're all recommending that we change it to powers and duties because that's how the, or, or the enabling legislation uh, reads that. Right. right. And so that, so we, re, we actually, the duties that were covered in the old bylaws were lower in the document. So what we're doing is we're moving powers and duties into one place instead of it having two places. And that now matches the enabling legislation. Yep. Um, and that's basically what that whole, we didn't really make any changes to the bylaws they're just, you know, moving over the edit, edit or the new wording from the enabling legislation. Correct. Um, the, uh, the section, or sorry, let me move back up. So the, our powers and duties, uh, A is to conduct an ongoing and comprehensive review of code um, and it, this is the list of everything, again, that, that is, is in our uh, enabling legislation. And the city council may direct the committee to review other chapters. Um, and then the committee makes recommendations to city council for um, any revisions uh, to uh, Inglewood city code. And then we list out, even though most of everything is found in, chap in title 15, that there are some other chapters in code that we would be um, looking at, and again, this is from the enabling legislation. Right. Um, secondly, we would review the processes, procedures, and administrative functions of code enforcement, um, and the committee shall make res recommendations to the city manager uh, or designee for improvements. And again, that's from the enabling le legislation. Uh, C, seek input from members of the community regarding enforcement priorities of code enforcement to utilize the resources providing in a manner that needs, needs, meets the needs of the community and then develop community education efforts to inform uh, people about code enforcement initiatives and regulations, which is something that I think that this committee is really, um, you know, over the past couple of years, we've really stepped up to help educate, you know, the community. So I'm, I'm glad um, that's, that's still in there. And then D, uh, the committee is a conduit of communication between the city council manager, city manager and the community and gathers and assesses the information uh, necessary to make sound recommendations as needed. Um, and then here we say make annual recommendations to all stakeholders as needed, but no less than annually. And for the newer members um, in the, I don't, 
I, I think the last time we, you know, we have presented every year to council just on the status of code enforcement and what our activities and issues have been. Um, and I think that's what that area uh, addresses. So we want to that, establish a date and where do we want to put it? I don't think we need to establish a date because that the, the city council sets their agenda and lets us know. Um, so that's our powers and duties. Obviously, one needs to be removed. And then uh, we go down to general rules. Um, and this, I believe, was taken directly from our old bylaws. Um, and it is the committee shall organize, adopt administrative rules and procedures and elect from its members as we deem necessary. And officers of the committee uh, will be elected for one year terms and that will be limited to two consecutive terms. Colleen? Julie, Julie that wasn't uh, taken. That's in the bylaw. I mean, in the enabling legislation. Okay. I put in parentheses bylaws because they neglected to do that. Before it, it read uh, that the bylaws are ours and everybody should, we should develop these. And instead of saying that, they said the committee shall organize, adopt administrative rules. So I put it in parentheses, bylaws. I don't understand. So, because these are the bylaws, right? Well, we are making the bylaws, but the general rules came out of the enabling legislation. I see. It changed the wording. Uh, it says essentially the same thing. It just doesn't say bylaws. So that's why I put bylaws in parentheses. So should that be changed? No. So does the word bylaws come out? No. I put it in parentheses just to emphasize the fact that that's what it used to say and these are our bylaws and we are going by the general rules. Okay. I mean, if you're going to put in a definition like that, I would just, I would put that maybe in quotes right after procedures because it's not really about the officers. It's, you're, you're saying that the administrative rules and procedures or otherwise call them bylaws, right? Yes. Yeah. I would, because to me, it's weird where it is. I didn't get that. But okay. If you, well, if you, if you put it in quotes right suggest. after procedures, that would make it pretty clear that we're kind of defining it. That's fine. I, I agree with you. I was in a hurry and I didn't, um, it didn't assess that properly. Okay. Or even just general rules or, or even just, you know, wherever we're titling this overall thing, just put, you know, or bylaws or, you know, if we need well, that word anywhere. The problem is they're enabling legislation. They kind of jumbled some stuff up, but uh, I don't really care. I just wanted to, because before it said we shall develop our own bylaws and now they left that word out. So is there something that indicates we need that word? Uh, because we're titling the document bylaws. <laughs> so basically what we're saying is that we will organize, adopt rules and procedures and have our own bylaws. Yeah. So why don't we just list the bylaws that with in the above sentence, add that to it instead of having it in a separate place. Sure. Well, I liked Carson's idea of putting it after procedures. Julie. Okay, yes, Maureen? You don't even have to have bylaws in there because these are your bylaws. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking these too. These are your bylaws. And what you're saying in your bylaws is that the committee shall organize, adopt administrative rules and procedures and elect members. Inside of your bylaws, these are your bylaws. You don't have to put it in parentheses. Okay. I mean, you, you can, but it's not necessary. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, too. whatever. Okay. All right. So we'll just strike that out. Um, and my note over here 
was this is a repeat um, it had something to do with I what was that about sorry guys I don't remember what that comment was I think it was just in another location some no attendance was in another location oh uh, Um, I think we fixed it. Yeah, it must have been an accepted change. Yeah, I, I accepted the change. Sorry about that, guys. I, I did this several weeks ago, so. <clears throat> All right. So, so if you want I, to take out, was recommending uh, is we that's only, okay with me. Okay, and I, I was just recommending we didn't need to have it in two different places, so I was recommending we take it out of there. Um, our ability to have a standing or special subcommittee um, within uh, uh, code enforcement, an example of that is our communication subcommittee. Um, then C, the responsibilities shall not extend to directing or interfering in the work of any officer or employee under the city manager, either publicly or privately. And again, that was taken directly from the enabling legislation. I added here, that um, I would like to talk about um, how the committee responds to community inquiries. Um, and, and what I'm really thinking about more specifically is um, on next door, because the city does not respond to questions on code on next door, but we as a committee I think it's an opportunity for us to use that platform to educate people that have questions about code. But no, I like that idea, but I don't know that you should put it as D under general rules uh, because, well, maybe you should, I don't know. Well, the reason that I, that I wanna put it under general rules is that I wanna make sure that committee members understand that they need to act as we need to act as a committee so that, um, well, and I'm not referring to if your neighbor asks you what's the rules regarding weeds, certainly you answer that question. But um, if, if um, for example, um, uh, someone comes to me and, and has a concern about um, code enforcement or activities or anything like that, is, is, am I allowed to respond to that um, either in a private or a public setting. And what I would like to recommend is that as a committee member, we, we need to behave as a committee and not as individuals. And that those types of questions um, be forwarded to the committee versus an individual acting on their own. Okay, I had no idea that's what you meant by that. Um, but that makes sense. I mean, that could just be a statement about if you're, you know, as a committee member, if some, if you're, if someone's asking you a question or if you're potentially going to be responding that you, you clarify that you're, you know, responding as an individual, not as the committee or bring it to the committee so that we can respond as a committee, something like that. I'd like to bring it to the committee and uh, decide whether we should respond to it as a committee. What I, what I want to avoid is, um, I, I'm just going to be, I, 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 is, is in the past, committee members have taken on um, complaints um, by members of the community on their own. And, and I think that that's not in the spirit of what this committee is for. Um, and they, they took it on as their own personal um, uh, task to resolve. And that's really not our role. That's, that's the role of code enforcement. And if um, there's still an issue, then it needs to be brought to the city manager's attention. Monica? Um, I like your idea. Just as a committee member, I would hate to hastily give someone incorrect information or do something that would conflict with one of the other members. And I think also it reinforces the point that, in fact, it is um, code enforcement's job to 
resolve the issues. We are advisory and we need to remember that. It says in the rules right there that we shall not interfere with their work. We are here to just take in information. And I think the, that our meeting place is the best place to share that. And um, I think it's worth um, taking the time to respond appropriately. I don't have necessarily a recommendation at this point about how that would be written, but I wanted to bring it up as a discussion point and see if you all would be willing to put something in the bylaws that present, prevents um, an individual on the committee from taking on um, code enforcement cases themselves. I'm not sure I understand what you mean taking it on themselves. Uh, I would bring everything that I've heard to the committee. Right. And uh, either I'm in just a saying, let's put, forum, that, let's put that in writing, you know? Well, it's part of our job as, as conduit between the uh, com community. And also, we use that input from the citizens to make right. recommendations. So if people contact us individually, whether they know we're on Code Enforcement Advisory Committee or not, or we have an issue individually in the community, uh, I don't see any reason why we don't bring that to the committee and discuss it openly and decide if that's part of something we need to advise the city manager on a process improvement. Okay. It's already built into our enabling legislation. Uh, if you want to, if you just want to um, reinforce that, I don't see uh, anything wrong with saying something to the effect in regard to uh, functioning as a conduit and obtaining input from the community. We will just, you know, we will ask for this input, whether it comes individually to the to individual members, and then we'll put it in, you know, bring it before the committee to discuss whether it's appropriate to recommend a change in process, and, you know, something to that effect. But I think that that would be better to put under acting as a conduit uh, for the committee. I mean, acting as a conduit between council and the, and the committee, I mean, the community. <laughs> Sorry about Monica. that. How much of this is your concern about public responses on next door? Like one of us respond well, like in the name of code enforcement or something like that. That's kind of what, what pops I, into my head when you say this. I, I do have an example. Um, we had a committee member <clears throat> that decided to post a survey on next door on how they felt about code enforcement. And they, they announced themselves as a member of the Code Enforcement Advisory Committee and put, posted that on next door without the knowledge, input, or approval of anyone on the committee. That's an example. Um, another, another example, and this is kind of kind of out there, but if, if we're discussing, you know, changes to, um, you know, our, one of our uh, codes, you know, say um, licensing animal and, and one member is not in agreement, or is it okay for them to post their dissatisfaction with the direction we're going on next door? And I would say no, because they are acting as a member, they are a member of the committee. Um, and if they want to post on next door, they're acting as, as an individual. Okay. Well, but that's taken care of, isn't it? Julie, isn't that taken care of? Because, uh, it, and I can't remember what section it's under, but it was specific that uh, if, a, if an action is taken by the majority, it's imputed to everybody on the committee. So Where is that? And, uh, it's in there somewhere. Um, I just noticed it today. Uh, I don't remember that. Yeah, there's a couple of things that are kind of weird that way, but actually, I think it's under voting. Okay. But it says actions, and, and the same with council, uh, because council, you know, even if there's two dissents, uh, it's imputed as though the whole council agreed to this. So 
and it does say that in in uh, somewhere in there. So I don't think we have. Uh, I don't see anything in there that specifically says you can't, you know, claim to represent the committee, you know, if, as an individual. And I I think that's I think that's reasonable. There's probably a way to word it to to do that. But I also wouldn't want to take away our rights as you know, citizens to be able to say what we think on next door, as long as we're making it clear that we're, you know, I think, you know, maybe because we're on the committee, if we're going to make statements publicly about how we feel about something, then we should, maybe what we do is we put in our bylaws, you know, when representing your opinions in public, you state that, you know, this is my personal opinion and not that of the committee or something like that. And, and that was really what we had requested is that it's fine if you post on, you know, social media, whether it's next door or Facebook or whatever, your opinions um, or questions, but you must represent yourself as a citizen, not as a member of the committee. Yeah, I think we could word something like that to cover that. Okay. Well, um, I, I'll be happy to, you know, once we get through this today, I'll be happy to, to draft something small. Uh, you know, a, a statement regarding that. And, and again, I, I don't want it to be restrictive. I just want to make sure that, you know, the Code Enforcement Advisory Committee is seen as a unit um, and a group of people that are working together and we, we don't represent ourselves separately um, when interacting with the community. <clears throat> and I do also, I would also, I, I think it's also, you know, um, you know, one of the things I would like to talk about is, is, you know, do we step up our efforts, our, our education efforts? And, you know, when we see a question about code on Nextdoor or Facebook or anything like that, you know, let's respond to it. And if we do, how, how, does, how does that process work? You know, is there one or two people that, that monitor Nextdoor and when they see a question come up, they formulate an answer and, you know, a couple people approve it and then post it. Monica? Yeah, it sounds like a communications issue, right? Like, yeah. it's like putting out an article, but more in a real time way. And I, I just feel like um, it would be smart for us when we, because when we're responding to somebody's question, they want facts, not our opinion. Right. So we should ask Dave Lewis and we should refer to whatever the council has created for us now, yeah. you know, to, well, and, 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 and I, I, give yeah. them and I, I've, I've actually deliberately not responded to code questions because I didn't want to put, I mean, I, we, we should be considered as experts, but I didn't, I, I didn't feel comfortable portraying myself in a, as an expert and other people, you know, that are on next door that, are familiar with code have responded to those requests. Um, sometimes they're not accurate, um, or sometimes they're simply not responded to and they don't get an answer. Mm -hmm. Even giving them the link to what they're looking for. Like, I just feel like being as professional and factual as possible in our responses, because if any of you have been on Nextdoor, which I'm sure you all have, it can get heated and emotional and um, really hyperbolic. So. I, I would love if someone was the point person on that, I, you know, but it's, I think it's an important, that this is how people communicate nowadays. Right. Our articles are great. Right. Information on the website is very useful, but a lot of times people go right to next door, which might not always be the most factual place. And we, we could have a very positive role there. Well, it didn't work out very well for the city, uh, and I don't think they're posting anything now, and they weren't allowed to respond or monitor. That, I mean, the policy was nobody on city council or city staff was allowed to monitor next door. They posted oh, press releases once in a while, but otherwise uh, they couldn't respond. And that's why I think that, you know, we can add value because we, we, I mean, a lot of the questions are, does anyone know how high our fence can go? Well, w we know how to give them that answer and um, we can be a resource and fill the gap be that this could, because we know the city is not able to. Well, I can't because I refuse to be on next door. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, um, so what I what I'd like to propose is so I'll work on the community inquiries um, in terms of our bylaws, but um, if we could add that as um, well, I guess it would be added to our list of priorities because uh, somebody would need to work on it. Um, so maybe uh, what, I, what, I, what I propose is that we put it on our list of priorities and our next meeting, we decide where, where it goes. I just, I just emailed you all a suggestion <laughs> for it. <laughs> Great. But we haven't, we haven't done anything with uh, making recommendations on process improvement. And I think we need to look at it in broad strokes, not in, you know, little specific things. Because every time uh, we, we proposed uh, a code change, uh, we've been told, uh, well, it has far reaching effects and you need to understand how it ripples through the code. So that's why we can't just do one little thing because then they'll come back with, oh, how does, you know, the, the city attorney will come back with, well, we have to make all these other changes. And then, then it gets really messed up. Okay, but, well, so, so we've gone through and, and, and identified what we know is important to code enforcement to focus on and what we know that, that, that is an issue like EAB and we've established our priorities. So what I'd like to propose is, is we put that on our list and at our next meeting, we decide where, where it goes. Okay. Okay. The, the second um, suggestion I had um, is uh, um, interacting with city on behalf of the committee. Um, many times in the past, we, we've had, you know, we're working on code questions and we're, we're looking through an issue. We need to do, um, we need to get information from the city and we have to work with the department and um, request that information and it gets delivered. So, which is great. What we don't, what I don't want to see is one member deciding to use their role on the committee to get information um, and they're not, they've not been assigned that role and um, they're using city resources for their personal um, use versus committee use. And I, so I just want to make sure that when we do ask the city for information um, and provide input that, that we do it as a committee, not a, as, as individual people. But you wouldn't want to preclude any of us from our rights to be able to do open records requests individually. Not at all, not at all. I just don't want someone to do open records request because it, 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 and, and say it's something that we, we need for the committee when it's really not. Yeah. Is what I'm saying. Why? Pardon me? <laughs> don't don't be deceptive. <laughs> well, okay. is it worth being explicit here? That request. So. Pardon me. I don't think it's worth be, uh, being explicit. Because I think it could be done in one sentence for both. You just it basically you don't represent the the committee to the public or to the city okay. individually. And you don't act as an individual in your role for the, for the committee. Very good. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I totally agree. And I read what you sent Carson and it looks great. I think I that mean, I'm sure it can be better than that. That was just off the top of my head. How come I don't have sure. it yet? It's in your, know. Know. you might have to refresh your inbox, but I think, uh, yeah, we don't want to go down a rabbit hole. Your point is, you know, I, Julie, I think your points are excellent. Um, and we don't, everything doesn't have to be written out so in such fine detail, but right. I mean, there's so much implied with, you know, just giving the guideline, like you should ask, you should follow best practices basically is what you're saying. Maureen. Um, <clears throat> the city council has adopted Bob's rules of order and they've also adopted the council or the, the uh, community handbook that I sent out to all of you guys mm -hmm. today. And there are both of those documents have um, references to what you guys have been talking about. 
Oh, cool. Okay. Wonderful. Ethics. This is all about ethics. Right. So I will send out Bob's rules of order again to all of you. And no, okay. It, and you already received a handbook, so I would suggest that you all read that because you'll find references as to what you all been talking about. Right. Cool. I, I did not know it was in there. Yes. Thank you. Well, right. if so, if it's okay with you guys, I'll um, we can look through the handbook, and if it covers these two issues, then I see no need to have add to our bylaws. I agree. I agree. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, moving down into membership. Um, once again, this this matches our enabling legislation. Um, and I don't think there was anything unusual here. Yeah, there is something that I think we need to uh, discuss on how we might fix or do we need to fix because there's they said uh, a staff liaison and a police to give a uh, police liaison to give technical information and they can be combined. But the charter is specific that the recording secretary is assigned by the city manager. Uh, but I also have, so uh, do we have three then ex officio officers? And one of them uh, is a staff liaison who's no known has no known purpose. Uh, but I've got this email uh, from the city attorney when we were discussing this in April of 2018. Uh, and I asked the specific question: Who assigns the recording secretary to boards and commissions? And it was, it depends on the board. Some boards elect a recording secretary from their membership. Some just have over time uh, use the staff liaison. Boards with bylaws should address that question within the bylaws. So I don't know if we this or just go with it and just assume that we only have two staff liaisons, one recording secretary assigned and a, a police department liaison to provide, uh, but to say that to pro, uh, one person can provide both functions, what two functions? Because they didn't say staff liaison is the recording secretary and the police technician cannot be the recording secretary. So it's a little bit confusing, and I don't know if we suggest that they fix that or we just assume that the staff liaison is the recording secretary and write that in. Um, Julie? Yes, Maureen? The staff, the staff liaison is, the, I am the recording secretary. That's it, so. But it still leaves open that the city manager can make you the police liaison technician. So that's what I wanted to say that let's not say the city manager can do that. It's in the, it's in the enabling legislation. But when we say that uh, the city manager shall appoint a recording secretary because that's what the charter says, and appoint a police liaison to give technical information. And just leave it at that. I don't understand what's wrong with it the way it is. Well, one, the charter says that it's a recording secretary, uh, but for the, the enabling legislation just says staff liaison. And it says that staff liaison and the police technician can uh, be one person. Well, that's what that's what that's what we're that's what this document is reading as. I know, what, but should do we fix that or not? I don't understand what's wrong with it. Well, I do have this memo from the city attorney that says we can choose our own recording secretary from our membership. But 
the charter says one thing and this enabling legislation says something else. What is the charter you're talking about? <laughs> I knew that question was coming. <laughs> the city charter says, and it's controlling, that the city manager appoints a recording secretary for each and every board and commission. You're talking about the municipal code? No, the municipal code is added, uh, is the added laws uh, fulfilling the charter. The charter is controlling. If, uh, Are you talking about where it defines our committee? No, that's the enabling legislation is in the Muni code. The charter specifies that a recording secretary is to be appointed by the city manager for each and every board and commission. Um, Julie? I feel like the way we have it written here is fine. I'm okay. I'm okay. Maureen? I just want to clarify to Carson that the charter is like the constitution for the city of Inglewood. It is the controlling document and everything under everything else follows underneath it. Okay. okay. So the, the charter is where the rules are for creating the municipal code. Kind of. It basically lays out how the city's going to be run. Um, and I have that and I can email it to you guys tomorrow if you'd like. Okay, I'm curious. Okay. My, my, my point is, is that, that what you're saying, Colleen, is that you want it to say instead of staff liaison, you want it to be recording secretary. Correct. But I, th I want to, uh, to address the fact that the recording secretary cannot be the police liaison that provides technical information. So the enabling legislation is in violation of the charter at this point. Do we note that and fix it or just let it ride and hope nothing ever happens? Um, Maureen? The recording secretary could be the police liaison. The police liaison could be deemed the recording secretary. So it's not in violation. What has occurred and has occurred for pretty much every um, advisory board is that there is a separate person to that, that has been appointed as the recording secretary and then a, a technical person that provides technical information. But that technical per person could actually be tasked to do the recording. Well, I personally, I think that is a conflict of interest and it caused a problem before because- I don't see where it's a conflict of interest because the minutes have to be approved by the committee, right? It's got nothing to do with the minutes. It has to do with getting the technical information and agendas and everything else. But it's, I just think it needs to be fixed or addressed in some other way. But uh, if you want to leave it, that's up to you. Colleen, in your, in your edits, the document with your edits, did you make a recommendation for that? Yes. Where did that go? I don't know. I put in uh, per charter, the city manager assigns a recording secretary and then i put below that the enabling legislation says staff liaison and the technician can be one and the same person and then there's another section on uh originally it said that the uh chair could assign the recording secretary from the ex officios, because there were three before. And uh, we had changed that, though it never got into the document uh, that was ultimately signed. We had changed it to what the charter said. But I think that's a conflict. And if, if the police do it, then uh, it becomes an overtime issue. And which is why we ended up 
not having the police secretary uh, come with the police technician. Different. Yeah, but the overtime issue, that's really the city manager's call, you know. Well, that's uh, why they changed it to separate the two, and now they want to change it back. So, boring. I don't know, it seems to me that it's a conflict with the charter, and uh, the way it's reading is that uh, we actually have three ex officio, which we had before, but the enabling legislation says two. Maureen? Um, yeah, I'm not paid any overtime. But <laughs> yeah, but the police secretary was. <laughs> yes. And, and I have no idea. Secondly, um, like I said previously, the the technical liaison, which would be the police or Dave Lewis, who's giving you guys information, could be assigned to be the recording secretary. There's no reason why they couldn't be. But it's been chosen that that the executive assistants of various departments will be the um, recording secretary or staff liaison, and you guys would have a separate technical advisor. Well, I don't think we need the redundancy of the recording secretary is assigned by the city manager and the city manager signs staff liaison and a police technician. Okay. I think it should say recording secretary. To be congruent with the charter. So, uh, so would you guys be okay if we left this, this item open so that we could see the charter and, and think about this? I, um, I don't really have a problem with the way it word it's worded and I don't see a conflict of interest. Um, so I'm not as concerned, is, but maybe if I see the charter, I'll feel different. Well, do we, uh, are we at all concerned with what the city attorney said that we could choose a recording secretary from our membership and that other boards have done it when that seems to me would be a violation of the charter? I, I mean, it's not an issue I, I see, but you know, if, if if there's a conflict in the description, I'm not opposed to making it so that it's clear. But I mean, it's not something I'm concerned about at all. Yeah, I, I, I'm not either. So, so Maureen, if you wouldn't mind sending that out, um, and then we can we can pick this back up at our July meeting after we've had a chance to review it. And I and at this point, we're we're coming up to two hours. Um, and uh, I, I just to... on one of those points that we already touched on, Julie. Yes. Um, the I did just go through the board and um, committee Handbook. rules and Bob's rules, and it does address committee members um, representing. They have to state they're representing them as themselves when addressing city council specifically. But I don't see anything about representing. Uh, making it clear that you're rep you're not representing the committee when you're communicating to the public like on next door or just talking to people or whatever so i do think since that doesn't exist unless maureen or someone else finds it where i couldn't um then it probably is worth making that clear like you okay. originally wanted and so i just sent an email to you all with that too cool so maybe we can borrow from that language and just put that statement in. I'll, I'll look at that. Um, we, did, we didn't quite get through our agenda today. Um, we, didn't, we didn't finish going through the bylaws. Um, so I, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to stop us right here since we, we've just finished discussing um, this whole um, sentence on membership. And we pick, after looking at the charter, we pick back up here at our next meeting and complete the review of the bylaws. It, it went a lot better than I thought it would because it was really complicated to review. So I appreciate um, you all working through this with me. Um, so what I would like to do is schedule our next meeting and call this meeting adjourned. Um, our next meeting would be, oh, I can't believe we're talking July already. Yeah. Is that July 15th? Or July 22nd? 15th. 
I will be driving across the country. <laughs> How would you guys feel about having the meeting on the 22nd instead? Fine. Would you be okay with that, uh, Monica and Carson? Uh, that should be fine for me. Okay. Fine for me. All right. Awesome. Thank you. I. It would, yeah, I would, I'd be calling in from a hotel. Um, okay, so next meeting, July 22nd, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for your dedicated interest and, <laughs> and decorum during this meeting. Um, I'll, I'll see you all in a month. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.